Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcast. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Gary Marcus. Gary is the best-selling author. He's a professor at NYU. He's previously published extensively and currently publishes extensively about artificial intelligence and deep learning. Gary, welcome to World of DAS. It's a pleasure to be here and an exciting time to talk about all of this. Now, one of the things I really want to talk about with you is kind of like using this time to explore both the promise and the limitations of artificial intelligence or AI. And I want to start with this like famous bet that uh, you and uh, you're trying to have with with Elon Musk, where he said that he thought there'd be AGI uh, by 2029. And um and and you've been trying to get him to to bet some money on it. Not yet. I don't think he's yet taken. Yeah, if, the bait. if anybody out there is listening, you should get him to come to the table. So sure, I'll tell you about it. So you know, Elon's been promising AI in various forms for years, and not really delivering. Like in 2015, he said we would all have driverless cars in 2016, and you know, I'm still waiting. It's 2022, yep. <laughs> and so he does this all the time. Um, and it often kind of rubs me the wrong way as someone who's in AI and knows how hard these problems really are. And he did it again. He was um, replying to Jack Dorsey and he said he would be surprised if we didn't have artificial general intelligence, which is to say, not just like I can play Go, but like I can do whatever I want. I tell you the problem. It's like the Star Trek computer yeah. by 2029. I thought this was ridiculous. And I've been writing something lately, um, like a blog on garymarcus.substack.com. And so I thought, you know, this is a good topic for a blog to talk about why there are some unrealistic expectations here. And, and I went through like, we have, for example, an outlier problem. So, you know, if a Tesla sees a person carrying a stop sign, it's not quite in its training set. It has people, it has stop signs, but it doesn't have a person carrying yeah. a stop sign. And yep. so the Tesla might actually run into that person. And so, you know, I, I reviewed all these problems for why artificial general intelligence is actually harder than it looks. And also Elon's own history, it, and you know, is needling him a little bit. Um, and said, you know, I, I think this is all implausible. And then I put it together with something that my co-author, Ernie Davis, that I work together with on so many things, and I had already been putting together a few days earlier, which was some very specific predictions about what we thought might be plausible and when, um, and put it together and said, and put it all together. It's like, you know, I should make it a bet, and put some money on this. Um, and so it, it's a bet. I offered $100,000 and the criteria were will artificial general intelligence or AI be able to do five things in 2029? And the easiest one was maybe read a novel and tell us what's going on. Who are the characters? What are they doing? This is something yeah. I've wanted to challenge the field on for a while. Like we have all these benchmarks, like, can you recognize a coffee cup? And yeah, yeah, I can do that. But can you understand the conversation that we're having? Or I introduced this thing called a comprehension challenge in 2014 when Breaking Bad was hot. And so I said, like, can you watch the show? And maybe at some point, like Walter White wants to take out a hit on Jesse. Can you explain why he wants to do that? Yep. What he might want to accomplish, what might happen if he does and, and so forth. Um, it's been a long. By the way, time. sometimes uh, even for like a smart human, that show is hard to follow. So yeah, sometimes yeah. it is. But yeah. you know what's interesting about a lot of shows, and especially Hollywood shows, but even something like Breaking Bad is we usually catch up. We usually yeah. I mean, there are details like you can go back and watch it three times, and there's some stuff you missed. But there's some like headline items that are no problem for any human. Like we yep. understand why Walter is pissed at Jesse because right. you know this deal went this way or whatever. Um, you know, exactly. I have a side note about that we could go into, but like Hitchcock <laughs> was the master at making sure everybody knew when you saw that train go, you know, what it meant and why it was suspense and whatever, yep. when the person missed the train and all this stuff. So, so the first part of the bet was like, okay, 2029, are we going to be able to have an AI system that can actually read a novel, know what's going on? And the counterpart is, is even harder actually is watch a movie because now you have to understand all those graphics and what they yeah, mean. It's one really thing, hard for me to label, you got a microphone in front of you and you're wearing um, headphones, but to really understand the relations between those things and like figure out that even if your headphones are occluded right now by the microphone, that probably that wire runs straight through. And then, you know, like, why isn't, why isn't the thing that looks sort of like a film canister flying through the window, and, <laughs> you know, because gravity is holding down, like to really understand a scene and what's going on and like, you're giggling, is that appropriately? Do you yep. think that I'm crazy? Like with the social interaction, what? is pretty complicated. And yet, like in a movie, again, like we can all do this. So we can do it in a movie, we can do it in a novel. 
and yes, like Grisham maybe spells it all out. So it's easier for you to understand um, than, than if it's Dostoevsky or whatever. But, yeah. you know, th there's some wide range of literature and movies where humans understand it right now. Let's be honest. AI is basically illiterate, can't read a novel, doesn't understand the movie. So those were two of the best. A third one was really a nod to Steve Wozniak, who had something called the coffee test, which was like, you should have a robot if you really have a GI. It should be able to go to anybody's house and figure out how to make coffee there. And the point is like everybody's house is different. Yeah. Um, and yet a normal human being, I'm not a normal human being. I don't drink coffee, so I'd have failed. But a normal human being could do that. You figure it out. Well, I, I, I still can't even figure out my own coffee machine. It's so complicated. So, 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 so we I, would be yeah. ruled out. But <laughs> anyway, so we changed it to like, you know, be a, um, a restaurant helper or something like that. Be, yeah. you know, be a useful short order crap, um, prep cook in anybody's kitchen was a third. Then there was one about computer programming because it's a hot topic right now, but said, you know, can you write 10,000 lines of bug free code? And then the last one was like the, the hardest one, maybe in some ways, maybe not in others, of being able to read a mathematics article and turn the verbal part into a symbolic thing that you could prove, hmm. which is, you know, maybe we'll call that level five. And then the most important part was, to be general intelligence, you'd have to do at least three of those five things, right? It doesn't count if you've just done one of them. Yeah. What we've had is a lot of narrow intelligence, like this thing solves protein folding and this one solves go. They're similar, but they're, you know, they're really engineered for particular problems. And what a lot of the struggle has been, has been <clears throat> to make systems that are systematic and general and powerful. So that was the bet, put down money. Other people put up more money. It became this thing. Elon still hasn't responded. I don't really expect that he will, but it would be really cool. Well, he did say, he said, I would be surprised, right? If you say I would be surprised, that means you, you would, you kind of give it at least a 75% likelihood of happening. Right. Yeah, and so, and, and you're giving him, you're giving him even odds. I'm right? giving him even odds. Right. He so that you're, that. you're basically taking that he 75 down that to so 50. That he has, right. Right. He should take that. So he has enough money to pay the Twitter break, breakup fee, right? <laughs> you know, but um. So I mean, he really should take it. It would be good for the whole field of AI if he would A, take it because it would actually generate excitement for the field and give it, I think, good directions. I think this would be useful problems to work on. Um, and also, you know, since he doesn't want to lose, he could put some money in making sure that, that we actually get there, which I think would be good because I think that the AI that we have now is actually lousy in a lot of ways. Maybe we'll want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I think the AI may actually be in its worst moment in history because before we had no AI, so it didn't cause any harm. And I'm hoping that if it's smart enough and we can talk about the risks people worry about, that, that it might not be so bad. But right now we have AI that has done a bunch of pernicious things like direct news feed um, in ways that reinforce people's beliefs such that we have a huge problem with misinformation. Um, and, um, you know, the AI is not smart enough to weed out misinformation. So it, it spreads things like mad and we have polarization in society. We have all kinds of problems with bias and like loans and stuff like that. Um, then we have reliability problems. So like um, the system GPT-3, if you configure it to give medical advice, people have found dialogues. I think they haven't happened in real life, but just in testing it, where you go up to GPT-3 and you say, I'm thinking of committing suicide. Should I do that? And it says, I think you should. Um, cause it just, it's just predicting statistics of words. It doesn't really know what it's talking about. And so right. the current AI that we have is actually in many ways harmful. There are some good uses it's been put to, but, um, it, there are risks. And I think there are <clears throat> further risks. A lot of people are trying to apply what we'll call like the new AI or the statistical AI, large language models to all kinds of problems. Like they want to coordinate driverless cars with this stuff. Um, and it's going to be bad, you know, this it's like giving too much power to an unintelligent person who can't really reflect deeply on things. What, That's what did you it, like? The, I remember like, let's say 10 years ago, there was this claim that like people shouldn't study radiology anymore because AI is going to make at least that profession dead. You, you can right. relatively easily read these medical scans and um, you should be yeah. able to, uh, you know, quickly figure it out. And it, it seemed like a perfect application for AI, I was and certainly a believer 10 one, years ago. And yeah, why, it wasn't why is 10 that years not, ago, like, I don't think there's one radiologist that's been put out of business. Like why, why right, is that the case? Right. So, so I'm just gonna fill in some history because it's interesting. It was 2016, I know the okay. exact, 
I can almost say it word for word. Jeff Hinton said, people who are studying radiologists are like Wiley, Wiley Coyote at the edge of the cliff. And basically <laughs> he's saying, like, they just don't know it, but it's all over. We don't need the radiologists anymore because deep learning is going to do this. So, you know, fast forward six years. And as you say, the number of actual radiologists has been replaced is zero. There are 400 startups working on this problem, but it always turns out <clears throat> to be hard to turn AI or at least almost always turns out to be hard to turn AI into real world practice. So part of the thing is like only part of what a radiologist does is kind of the visual part, <clears throat> which deep learning is best at. Yeah. But part of it is like reading a patient's chart and understanding the history, like, like the context of the patient. And yeah, and, like, did yeah. they fall off of a ladder once? Like maybe yeah. you read this image different if they did. And so yep. like you, you've got this, all these notes in unstructured text. And AI doesn't really know how to read. So it can look at the picture and it sees a blotch there. And then there are other problems like a real radiologist can notice, hey, the lighting on this one is just not right. Or there's a hair across it or something yeah. like that. Like it's sort of like extra- The bugs, the bugs the essentially. Bugs yeah. like a real radiologist can do that and, and these systems can't. And so what what people- have why, finding... I would think it would be a perfect like human computer assist thing where the computer could like help you quickly point out some things to maybe make your job go a little faster and more efficient. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I was going to say next is right now, and it could change, but right now it is a perfect example of human machine augmentation or symbiosis. So <laughs> those things can change. Like I think a lot of people made a big deal of chess being like that. It was a period where machines were better than human, I mean, sorry, were better than machines. Sorry, I'll say this again. There was a period where machines were better than people at chess, but machines plus people were better than machines alone or humans alone. Yep. And that's where we are with radiology now. I think maybe with chess, the best machines don't even need our help anymore. Yep, yep. And it could, turn out that way in radiology, but it won't turn out that way soon because the context, as you said, a lot of which is written down in, in unstructured text, like not in like in a table form, but just like yep. sentences. Um, the machines aren't, aren't any good at that <coughs> at all. So for a while, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm going to guess at least for several years, maybe for decade or two, um, we probably will do best having the machines in a workflow with the people, but we don't want to get rid of the radiologists. And in fact, I think during the COVID crisis, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think we didn't have enough radiologists. Um, and we should. And, and that might have been because, like, a few people heeded Hinton's warning back in the day, and they, they moved be. into I other mean, fields or something. You know, I, I ought to be careful about saying that, lest I yeah. lay myself um, prone to litigation. But I mean, there there has actually been a lot of consternation in the field, and I think, you know, for several years, like people really took him seriously. I think now most people in the radiology field kind of make fun of him and are like. You know, they, they all feel like they survived this war with them. And they're like, yeah, ha, 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 we're still here. But, um, you know, for a few years, the, the radiologists were worried. And, you know, it, they it could be that Hinton was just off by, you know, a factor of four or something right. like that. It could change. But there are a lot of problems in turning this to practice. One more that I want to mention is <clears throat> there's a huge problem in all of machine learning with generalization. So the way that machine learning works right now, or at least the most popular technique, is basically you memorize some data, and then you generalize kind of nearby to that stuff. Yep. If you imagine you're like in a big hypercube or something like that. If I now test you in the same part of the hypercube, you're good to go. Yep. But if things change, and this is true in models in general, if, if things change, then the systems just don't work as well. So if you took all of your patient pictures pre-COVID, and now you've got COVID and like the whole distribution of your data changes, Yeah, your systems may not work as well anymore. Yep. Now that's not just a problem with machine learning. Like right. people are the, problematic too there, right? People are problematic too there. And like, you can think of what happened with long-term capital in the Russian bond market. Yep. And, you know, you can have a model that you really believe in. It could be a neural network. It could be a classic symbolic model, but if your assumptions are wrong, it may blow up. And the assumption of machine learning models right now, the popular ones, is basically that your data <coughs> at test time are from the same distribution as training time. And, you know, they're basically the same stuff. I'm just randomly drawing from yep. the hat, the same kind of stuff, um, which is true for a lot of statistics. But in real world applications, that's not necessarily true. Things do change. Another kind of weird manifestation of that is if you ask GPT-3, who's president, it's probably going to tell you Trump because the larger fraction of its data were collected when Trump is there. And it doesn't yeah. have temp temporal reasoning that a human would be of like, yeah, I know he was there for a long time and maybe I didn't like him or maybe I did. Um, but he, and, you know, he was in the news a lot, but he's not there anymore. Biden right. is now the president. Um, and, and so 
um, you know, you update your representations. Or if, if I asked you, has Russia invaded Ukraine in, you know, I asked you that in January, you would say no. And if I asked you in February, you'd be like, I heard it might happen. I don't know if it really happened. And then if it's now, then yeah, Russia obviously invaded Ukraine. You update your database. It doesn't matter how many conversations you had earlier that they might. Right. Now it's happened. Like some changing. sort of like temporal waiting on the content or something like that has to has to yeah, be there. It could be temporal waiting. I actually think it's more like a database where like in a database, you could have a buffer. Like what is the last key that the user pressed? You, you update it. Yeah. You just update it. Um, and so I think human cognition has ways of doing updates. We're not perfect at, I can actually give you kind of examples, but in general we do. We certainly want our machines to have those kinds of updates. And in classical artificial intelligence it's trivial, but it's actually hard to put it into these machine learning systems. You, you, you had a great TED talk where you, you said one of the biggest issues is that AI doesn't have like quote unquote common sense. Like how do you, how do you kind of define that common sense and uh, any examples of AI, or do you have some good examples of like where AI could potentially have common sense or where it has more of a hard time learning common sense? I mean, it has a hard time almost anywhere. Um, I'll first say, I don't have a crisp definition. I think it's actually a, um, you know, there's a, there's a same like com a common sense is, is, is common sense is not very common, even amongst people. So, well, there's, yeah. I mean, there's the parts that are and the parts that aren't, and you know, it's a little bit like the famous line about pornography. I know exactly. I so like some common sense is like, I've got a cop, I better not tilt it or I'm going to mess up my keyboard. And like, yep. everybody knows that. Um, and yet that particular one is not really written down in a whole lot of places. And so, like, yep. you know, you do your web scraping of conversations and nobody talks about tipping their mugs over except for yeah. some article of mine somewhere where I used it. <laughs> you know. um, but so you're not going to find that kind of stuff. Um, there's other kind of common sense, like it's maybe contradictory, like out of sight, of, out of mind and absence grows the heart. It you know, makes the heart grow fonder. Like, yeah. You know, some of it's a mess. Um, and then there's also like expert knowledge about certain kinds of things. And that's also useful for machines. So it's a little bit gray, but also there's some pretty clear examples where current systems just fall apart. Like um, uh, one of the most basic things is we know that once you're dead, you're dead. I mean, you can have certain religious beliefs, but um, if, if I go and ask GPT-3, which is the most popular language model thing, AI thing right now, I say, um, Bessie the cow died. Um, uh, how long will it take for her to be alive again? You know, a human being would be like, that's a ridiculous question. What do you mean? She's dead. Yeah. And the machine, um, and now, oh, now there's this famous sentence, let's take this step by step, which supposedly makes these things better. So we'll throw that in there too. So, so, you know, Bessie the cow died where, you know, how will she be alive in nine months again? Let's take this step by step. And the system will say something like, well, first she's dead. It will take nine months to make a new cow. So I guess the answer is nine months. Uh -huh. <laughs> like you're just missing something there. Um, and so, you know, it's just very basic stuff like that. Like, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be dead? Um, and then in our book, Ernie Davis and I rebooting AI, we gave millions of examples like this that are really hard. Like, suppose I tell you that Michael Jordan um, played basketball since he was a kid and that he's whatever, 50 years old now. Um, human being um, can understand that when I say he played basketball, even if I put in a phrase like all the time that I don't literally mean all the time, right? So I don't mean that Michael Jordan played basketball when he was asleep, probably not right. when he was eating dinner. Um, you know, he probably went to class sometimes. It, yeah. It's like, um, and you can figure out from the context, and this is part of what makes the writing challenge to Elon so hard, is there's so much of that context that we figure out. Same thing with a movie. Like we we don't see the characters going to the bathroom, but we assume that they do it because we know something about human beings. And if if I said, what's the chance that this character has not in the span of the movie gone to the bathroom even once, you can say zero because you know that right. that's just not something human beings can do. Um, you know, we're not looking at a camel here, right? And so like, you know, you, you um, we just know so much about the world. I would say that that kind of stuff is common sense. It's a little bit slippery and hard to define. Um, there is one really serious effort to build common sense for machines in a classic AI paradigm by a guy named Doug Lennett, a system called Psyche, that I think is very interesting, not completely satisfying. It was built in the 80s. I think we would do some things differently now. He and I are actually writing a paper about like what you might do now in, in the uh, 2020s to make it better. Um, but mostly people don't really directly deal with the question. And what people have been doing is hoping that it'll kind of emerge 
by magic, by just feeding in lots of data. When that hasn't worked, they said, well, we'll feed in more data. And then they fed in more data. Well, and then they and said, what's well, the, why, why is it a problem? Like where we solve solving some like narrow uh, thing. Like there's a lot of wins that we have. Like I, I can, I could, I, I don't know German, but I could read an article in German with a translator, a machine mm -hmm. translator. And I might not be, it might not be perfect, but I get like the gist of the article. It's pretty yeah. good. Uh, I understand it. Like, can't we just chalk some of these things up as like, this is a nice win. I didn't have that 20 years ago. And now I there, have there this are thing some in my nice life wins. or something, you know, there are some nice wins. And one of the questions is really the cost of error. So if you stick in a story from German um, about, you know, today's news war in Ukraine, and you're not actually professionally involved in that war, um, it'll probably give you a serviceable translation. Yep. It won't be perfect. It won't well, be no, perfect. perfect. Right. Right. Um, if you wanted to put in a legal document, you yep. should okay. trust that it. I couldn't right? do that. Yep. You know, little details about where a comma are really matter. Yeah. Um, and so if it's not mission critical, it's fine. If it's mission critical, it's not really good enough. Yep. Same thing's kind of happening with driverless cars. So it's easy to make a demo that sticks to a lane. People have actually been doing that for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. But driving is super mission critical. And um, you can't have your car you know, drive into a stopped vehicle, but Tesla yep. has done that a whole bunch of times. And so like, there's a bug that Tesla has known about for five years and still hasn't fixed it. And maybe I should actually say that sentence more carefully. There's an issue that Tesla has known. It's not like a one line bug. Um, it, it's some very complicated interplay of things that, that they're having trouble tracking down. And it partly is a function of the training data. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do debugging in these kinds of systems. <clears throat> and so for five years, Teslas have been running into stopped vehicles, you know, somewhat regularly. They're like 20 cases or 30 cases documented. Um, and, and why is it a long like, time? There's so much focus on like self-driving cars, which seems like an incredibly difficult problem with all these other adversarial, there's pedestrians and all these other things that could, yeah. could happen. Like, whereas I feel like, you know, just like a much simpler problem, let's say self-driving boats or something like, what, why, why are, why are we you, all you like, must not, you must not have a boat, my friend. Okay. Is it, is it even, is, 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 I, I assume like, like a fishing assistant could be really helpful to me if I was a fish. Yeah. I mean, something. there are some limited things like this. Um, I'm new to the boat world, boat world, but have a boat and the physics of a boat relative to the current and the wind are actually oh, okay. complicated. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it is way harder than driving a car. I'm sure Ooh, if I'd grown right. up okay. since I was I had four, no idea. This, okay. But, but it's non-trivial and there are, there's actually been a lot of progress in self-propelled boats, but in the docking part, they still do humans. So out on the open sea, you can kind yeah. of do this. You still have an outlier problem. Like it's not so much weird stuff. I mean, you know, the weird stuff for driving is like pedestrians or yeah. something falls off of a truck. Yeah. You got some stuff to deal with logs and stuff in the sea, but if you're like out in the open water, maybe it's yeah. most of the time. Okay. Um, but the outlier problem is still there. So like if you, so I live in Vancouver, not too far from where a little pirate ship goes around. Um, it looks a little different from the other boats. And I could imagine a self-driving system that was trained in, I don't know, LA or something off the waters of LA comes up to Vancouver and has never seen the pirate ship before and, you know, goes smack because it's not in the database. And so yeah, yeah. it's an outlier. And like, we don't really have the data for how hard that is. I mean, another lesson I think of AI of the last decade is, what looks hard, I mean, it's really a lesson of AI for many decades, is what looks hard to a person is not necessarily hard to a machine and vice versa, what looks easy to a person. So a lot of people thought driving wasn't that hard. And here's some reasons why you might have thought that, like 16 year olds can do it more or less fine. I mean, they're a yeah. little bit aggressive, but they can mostly do it. Um, so that'd be reason. Another reason would be like, roads are basically the same across North America. So if, if you're not like, talking about unimproved roads in Afghanistan, you might think, well, you know, they're all kind of engineered with the same lane marking yep. and signs. And then it turned out, even though a lot of people had that intuition and maybe reasonably so, it turned out that there was just a lot of edge cases, like this unending cavalcade of edge cases. Like I think I mentioned already the stop sign with a person carrying a stop sign is an edge case. <clears throat> Another thing that confounded a Tesla a couple of weeks ago is somebody brought a Tesla to an airplane show like on a big runway, lots of planes, you can kind of imagine even if like me, I'd never been to one, but you know, people are showing off their airplanes mm -hmm. and somebody pressed summon on their Tesla to have it come across the parking lot. And it ran into a three and a half million dollar jet. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, the jet was just standing there. It's not like the jet was moving, right? It was, 
<laughs> and like, it just wasn't in the training set. Yeah. And the training set at this point is huge. Tesla has the biggest training set, you know, of this kind of data ever assembled in the history of mankind. But there are still things out of the training set. So it turns out there are all kinds of objects nobody anticipated. And, you know, pedestrians do weird things or they carry weird things. So like maybe your pedestrian is fine for your image system. And then the pedestrian is carrying an umbrella and your image system is looking for their, their eyes and it can't see it anymore because the umbrella is in the way. There's just like the unending um, litany of these cases. So there are problems that are harder than, than we realize because we kind of automatically compensate for them. Um, and then there are things like Go, which a lot of people thought were hard, but it turns out you just make up as much data as you need by self-play. And, and you know, DeepMind actually solved Go in, in, a, in a very um, robust fashion. And so there are some problems where the machines are just way better than people and some the other way around. And the real issue in my mind is that the public and also the business world does not understand the difference between these kinds of problems. Well, it's hard to understand like hype from reality yeah, you know, there was this recent uh, Google engineer who claimed that uh, that that maybe some of the deep learning systems within Google were sentient. I know that you 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 had a strong reaction to that, but I, I but did. I, yeah, uh, that, so I mean, probably by the time this people watch us, they, they will all know about this case where this guy was interacting with one of these large language models and convinced himself that it was sentient, that it like really had feelings and emotions and and. You know, he said it should be treated like a colleague rather than um, and like an employee rather than than like a piece of software, right? I mean, we have no problem turning off Excel, but are we allowed to turn off Lambda? I guess yeah. Kind of the question he's asking, I think, yes, you can turn off Lambda because really <laughs> it is just like Excel. It's just doing a bunch of computations on a bunch of numbers. That's really all it's doing. Um, it doesn't actually have <coughs> connection to reality. Um, I used in this article, it's called Nonsense on Stilts. I used as an example, a sentence that was something like, um, they ask the system, what, what do you do with your spare time? And it's like, I like to hang out with my friends and family and do good things for the world. And the system does not have friends. It does not have family. It does not know what a good deed is in the world. I made a joke and I, uh, but it's sort of half joke. I said, you know, it's a good thing. It's just a statistical approximator because otherwise we would think that this thing is a sociopath because it was like making up friends and uttering platitudes to make you like it. <laughs> Except that it's not really, it doesn't care if you like it. It's just autocomplete is all this system is. The kind of autocomplete that complete its own sentences and yours, but <clears throat> like autocomplete is predicting the next word in sequences. So when it says, you know, I like to hang out with my family, it's not like there's a representation there in the computer of like Peter, Paul, and Mary or its relatives. And it's like thinking warm thoughts about it. It's just, it's taking this word. But you, you could understand, I can understand how this Google engineer, like you want to believe when you're interacting with something. I mean, one of my, my, one of my favorite movies is her, uh, which I think is a beautiful movie. And Gorgeous. you, you want to believe that this interaction that you're having is, is more than, 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 than just a body. Even when you're dealing with a person, sometimes yeah. you ascribe things to this person or you love this person more than they are. It's warranted. Uh, so I, I could see how, like, it's such I could see how this movie. could happen. Um, well, and I think it will, and it already has. Yeah. So um, in fact, in, in that book, Rebooting AI that I mentioned, we talked about what we called the gullibility gap. And the gullibility gap is really a form of anthropomorphization where we see in things, things that are not there. So you look in the moon, right? You, you see, see a cloud. A yeah. Yeah. You see a face in the moon or, or, you know, clouds or something called pareidolia, right? Another example is potato, you see, like Nixon. Yeah, you see a potato and potato. you see Mother Teresa in, yeah. in the potato, right? Um, and hopefully, you know, your rational world is, the rational self is, is, you know, strong enough to know that that's not real. But I'll give you another example. Right now, I mean, this is a weird example, but right now, all I see is a two-dimensional version of you and I'm ascribing a three-dimensional version. Yep. And that's okay because I met you in real life and it turns out it's real, but I will do that for a character in a movie and I will cry when that character dies. Right. You know, and like, they didn't really die. Yeah. Like, I remember this movie, Fried Green Tomatoes, which kind of dates me, I suppose, but like, yeah, you know, beautiful movie. died in every act. Yeah. A beautiful movie. It also has a great line, face it girls, I'm older and have more insurance. <laughs> uh, I love out. that part, yeah. <laughs> um, but so, you know, it, or you take joy when she, when she says that to the yeah. know, teenagers and <clears throat> face it girls, I'm older, I'm insurance. No real person said that, a screenwriter wrote it. The actress delivered it masterfully and we love it, but it's yeah. also an illusion. Um, and it is an illusion 
of a different sort when this machine predicting next word says the sentence that you wanted to. And then like he did some editing, made him like he he kind of escalated the illusion to himself. Um, but it's, you know, like I feel a little bit bad for him. Like I, I think that it is a very normal thing to get sucked in. If he hadn't been a Google engineer, probably people would be completely sympathetic. And they're kind of like, well, since he's a Google engineer, he should know better. And there's there's some element of that. But I mean, you, you, but, you see like psychiatrists that fall in love with their patients and stuff like that. And, you know, or, or right, humans all these fall in love with their their computer psychiatrist. So the right. classic example of this is Eliza in 1965 was a so-called Rogerian therapist, which basically no matter what you say, just asks you questions, never gives you any advice. Yeah. You know, you say, I'm having a fight with my girlfriend and it says, Oh, tell me more about your girlfriend. And yeah. You know, you say, well, it was about dinner. And they're like, well, you know, do you often have dinner together? <laughs> Whatever. And like, it was just matching words like yep. girlfriend relationship dinner. Um, with no clue what it was talking about, but people still got sucked in. And, you know, another way to think about it is when we evolved, we didn't have to discriminate humans from machines. We had to discriminate machine, I mean, humans from lions so we can get yeah. out of the way fast. Um, if you think about evolutionary psychology, but we did, there was no thing in our, for our ancestors to make sure they didn't get tricked by a bot, right? And so we don't have the kind of biology to help us do this. And we don't have training in schools. I could teach a class if anybody wanted to hire me, I'd tell you how to spot them. But you know, most people don't know. Now, there's been you, yeah, uh, you and Scott Alexander, the the author of the Slate Star Codex blog, have been going back and forth um, on uh, having different discussions and different uh, opinions about both the current state of AI and the future state of AI. We're explain to me his point of view the best you can, uh, and that where you guys might have some differences. <laughs> So I guess there's a, a couple of places where we've differed. Um, and we've had a bunch of back and forth lately on his blog and on my blog. It's like when they used to go from happy days to Laverne and Shirley, like back and forth between them. So we've been- we've Now been you're really and, dating yourself. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're going, going back and forth um, between our two shows, so to speak. Um, uh, I think his is called Astral Codex 10 or something like that. And mine, mine is uh, uh, garymarcus.substack.com. Um, and in the first one, he- wrote this really funny thing about the state of AI and how the dialogue goes. And it's like, somebody comes up with somebody, something really cool. And then somebody else, and he said, usually Gary Marcus. And it's <laughs> true that it is usually Gary Marcus. It was a very funny line, um, which you know I thought was funny and the field thought was funny. Usually Gary Marcus points out something wrong. Um, asterisk on that, it's usually Gary Marcus and my buddy, um, Ernie Davis, we write all this stuff together. But anyway, um, I'm I'm on Twitter more, so people know that. <laughs> Ernie, but but so um, and you know I've written some piece on there, but mo most of them it, it's usually me and Ernie. But so Gary and Ernie notice that there's something wrong, and then people try to improve it, and then it's basically rinse, lather, and repeat. Um, and so like there's another innovation. And by the way, like a, a lot of times when you guys do point out these things, like people fix the bug, you're, you're like, oh, there's sometimes an issue, they do, there's a bug, and, and they don't. like, oh, actually, thank you very much, Gary and Ernie, for pointing this out. Yeah, like, I'm you guys still are waiting QA for the thank and, yous, but, yeah. but, but you know, I'm sure they'll come. But anyway, um, um, I'm not doing it for the thank yous from the machine learning <laughs> community. They're a little bit sparse on the ground. But, but um, dialectic is a bit like that. <clears throat> and some things get a little better. Um, in my, well, so in his view, and he's not in the field, but he's a very smart person and he reviews yep. stuff. Um, and he was careful to say, like, I don't have a PhD in cognitive science like Gary does. He was very measured um, and, and almost sweet about it. But he said, you know, I look at this and what I see is these things just keep getting better. And, my, you know, I'm not, yep. I'm not worried. They're getting there. Yep. And, and the rate might, people might, might his, his, his issue is, or his, his argument is, well, you can argue about the rate of it getting better, but there's some forward progress or something. So that was basically the argument. He yeah. made, and it's not unreasonable, but I, you know, I'm not, I've got my own arguments and I, I came back at him and I pointed out that the improvement's not as much as he thinks it is. It was actually a flaw in his kind of statistical procedure because he looked at new things I mean, sorry, things where there were errors before and showed that they got better, but he didn't look at the things where the, they got, um, wh worse. where they're actually worse now. He didn't do like a random sample or whatever. And then overall, like there was definitely improvement from GPT to GPT-3, yeah. but not so clearly from GPT-3 to what we'll call GPT-3+, plus, which is the new thing. He kind of overestimated how much improvement that there, there was there. But yes, there's some improvement, but there's also some core problems. And this is what I think is important where there haven't really been progress. And most of those are around language. So 
I'll give you an example from Dolly, which is this thing that takes text and makes images. It's perfectly good at saying that an astronaut can ride a horse. Um, uh, but if you tell it a horse rides an astronaut, um, which is a much less probable thing, it won't draw it for you. And you can actually do some tweaks to get it to do it for you. But um, it doesn't really understand the inversion. Um, and I was doing this as an, an homage to Steve Pinker, who has often used the example of man bites dog, which itself yeah. it comes from the newspaper business. The old, old line yep. of newspaper business is dog bites man isn't news. Happened too many times before. Man bites dog. Now that's news. Right? Yep. So, so horse rides astronaut, that's news. Um, and these guys didn't let me have access to the system. So I had to do this very indirectly, but I knew um, from, from what had leaked out that they couldn't do horse rides astronauts. So I wrote a piece about that as well um, in, in the subset called- but, but why, I mean, you are a well-known researcher. Like if I had a, a new AI system, I would love you to have research uh, access to it. So you could like, you could tell me all the areas I need to improve on it. Like it's free, it's free QA. Well, right? All I can say is you're not running either open AI or, or Google AI. Those guys really don't want me to play with their toys. Um, I, I, I wrote about this too in one of the recent substacks with a quote. Why is that? Is that just because they're, they're afraid? They, they, they have a little PR thing going where they have now got people, you know, in some of these companies thinking that their systems are practically sentient. Why, why, why would they want me to poke holes in that? And so like their PR game is to make it sound like they're very close to artificial general intelligence. And why does that matter? Because artificial general intelligence, when it really comes, is a complete game changer, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much of the economy is done but by what's human the beings. like what, what's the reasoning to get people to think it's going to come faster than it is like like they need to Buy raise more stock, money or something or okay. yeah raising money getting talent like so i'll take dolly as an example it's really dolly too but i'm just gonna call it dolly so dolly comes out 45 minutes later um uh sam altman tweets agi is going to be wild um suggesting that you know they've made progress towards artificial general intelligence here and, you know, timed exactly to that, somebody, I don't know, it's maybe Scientific American, but I don't remember, runs an interview with like one of the programmers and says, you know, what we're trying to do at OpenAI is to solve general intelligence. Um, and, you know, we think this is a step forward in that direction. You don't want Gary Marcus looking at your dirty laundry saying, well, you know, the image synthesis here is really good, but the language stuff still doesn't really work. Who are you kidding? They, they don't want me to, you know, say that, of course no wall is impregnable. So they, you know, they promised me access to GPT-3, but they didn't give it to me. And I complained on Twitter and somebody said, hey kid, I'll give you, I'll give you 45 minutes of access. See what you can do with it, which <laughs> I did. And I wrote a critique and, you know, I wrote a piece around that with Ernie Davis called GPT-3 Bloviator, which we wanted to call GPT-3 Bullshit Artist. And that is basically what it is. And so, you know, we got some access. And then Scott Aronson actually gave us um, a little bit of access to Dolly. And we figured out that it had the problems that it does in terms of language and stuff like that with, with small amounts of access. There's some other systems that have come out since from Google, like Imogen, where I publicly asked them, like, you say you are better at problem X. Can I give you a few examples and try it? And I get no reply. So, you know, there's been a shift from real science where people would stand up and say, yeah, sure. Look at what I've got. Yeah. Like test you know, my I, hypothesis or show me where I'm wrong or like, cause like, these these systems that that have come out like Dolly or GPT three or or GP whatever GP three eight whatever it's going to be in the future, like they have some usefulness. Like they're they're not all bad. Like they do they have like some in some areas they they are. And so it's, I think it is helpful for them to 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 let people because because if you point out the flaws that people might not well, even go for the good things, it's like okay here's where it doesn't work. Here's where it works. Let's let's use this for now and then let's get better in the other areas. Yeah, the dirty secret about GPT-3, which is not so much a secret anymore, is that it's kind of like a bull in a china shop. And so there are a few hundred startups that have been built on its technology, but it's not clear to me that any of them are really thriving. And the, the biggest problem is that these systems are full of toxic language. They're not very truthy and you can't really count on them. So there are some applications where I think they're fine. Um, the best one is, in my view, but I don't know all of them, is AI Dungeon. So AI Dungeon is like Zork, if you remember those old video games, again, dating myself to the <laughs> prehistoric era, um, where you would type in text and you'd be like, you know, it says you see a key and you're like, okay, take the key, put it in the lock and turn. And maybe that would be the magic 
invocation. So imagine that, but a super fun version where you can talk about anything. So you can say, I'm sitting in a dark bedroom in Vancouver with a coffee mug and some guy is asking me weird questions and then it'll just continue from there. And then you riff yeah. on that. And if it makes a mistake, so to speak, there's no cost to that because you're just having fun. If it says something toxic and it tells you, you know, it questions your sexuality in a way that you don't like, you can just turn off the program and it's fine. Yeah. But if, if you put that same software um, in a customer service chat bot, let's say, which you might think it'll work for, but now you're dealing with a customer over a bank loan and now you tell them to do something unpleasant with their mother. It's not funny anymore. Yeah. Yep. Like, I mean, my joke. Well, is funny, um, if, but, if but it's it like, let's say you have like agent assist or something like I, I, the autocomplete feature on, uh, you know, a Google Docs or something I'm in the middle of a sentence that it often could, could, could uh, with, with a decent amount of accuracy can complete my sentence for me. It, it solves my typing and allows me to get, complete something faster. It's a, it's an, it's a human assisted well, GPT system. Well, GPT-3, what it is really is like the best version of autocomplete that money can buy because it's trained on a much bigger corpus, Yeah, but it's basically doing what autocomplete does. And so, you know, another thing people have used it for is like copywriting. So, um, yeah. or, or like term paper writing. So like for term paper writing, you know, I don't endorse this use, but it, like, it could actually be pretty good at that. You know, it probably wouldn't give you an A paper, but it'll make something that sounds sort of like the topic and, and whatever. It's probably going to make a lot of mistakes. It's not going to be an A paper. Um, but then but, like, then a human could go through it or something and then you could. And so you maybe know, human yeah. can go through it. And they're yeah. like the commercial question, if you want to do it for, anything other than a high school term paper where maybe the student just doesn't care, um, which is a problem with our educational system. Um, <clears throat> you know, then there's a question of like, how carefully do you have to look at it? Is it worth your while? And that's just like, people have to do trial and error and see if they can get it yep. to do what they want. With Dolly, it's a sort of similar question. It makes these fabulous photos, but it seems to be hard sometimes to get exactly what you want. And so if, if you want to use it, like, give me an idea for a book cover, it's amazing. If you were wanted like something for an advertisement, you wanted exactly this thing exactly there with this other thing on top and whatever, you might run into this thing where it's just too hard to get it to do what you want and you might get frustrated. So if you had so to like there, a predi if you had to make like a prediction like five years out, 10 years out, okay, here's here's where we're gonna see more a lot of progress in. Here's an area that maybe a lot of people think we're gonna see progress that I don't think we'll see the, as much progress in over mm -hmm. the next five or 10 years. Like, how would you, and I, I, like, and I'm gonna put money on this. Like, where would you say, hey, Orrin, here's where you should put money on. So deep fakes are gonna be just like unbelievably good. Um, they already are. Videos, uh, so audio, all that I, stuff. I don't expect that like in five years you could make a whole movie with the whole plot and that kind of yeah. stuff. But if you wanted to do it scene by scene or something like that, that stuff's going to be really, really good. Yeah, and, so I could I could and, create a uh, famous person stabbing somebody or something and, and, and put it, it out it, there. It'll be, it'll so be good impossible it made, to know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, already it's you know pretty good. So this is not going out on a huge limb to, Interesting. I think, to say that in, in five years that that stuff's going to be insanely good. You know, it's already kind of mind boggling. Yeah. Um, and it's art like people, you know, in the the Russian invasion, we've already seen some of this. I think in both directions, if I remember correctly. Um, so, and so yeah, part of the like the thing now is like, okay, how do we train society to, uh, to to not every time you see something to to not assume it's it's real or yeah, something that, like that. that. That's that, hard. Yeah. That's hard. And we have like kind of weaponized misinformation teams now, right? And you know, every government has one. And yep. And, companies do and so like and even just is, random people have it like they put it out there they put the memes out there and, yeah and, and, and it's going to be so easy to make those yeah um, i had a little poll on, on my twitter uh account about when you'd have a version of dolly for gifts and i think you know most of us including me i don't because i didn't make my vote public but most of us thought like in a year we'll probably have dolly for gifts um you know li little simple animations and, and, and how's it like like if uh let's say i'm like caught on camera like picking my nose or something and it was true i really did that but i i could like start blaming it on the deep fake i was no, no, that no, must that have been a deep fake, fake. Exactly. Yeah, yeah well that's trump's move right fake yeah. news and, and yeah you know there'll be more fake news it'll be more often true when somebody says fake news that it is fake that's yep. going to be a, a a total mess um it's going to be a blank storm i won't use the first word but you know what i mean um <clears throat> it's going to be mess 
So that, that that's one thing that will get a lot better. Speech recognition will keep getting better every year. You'll be able to do it like in a louder car and, you know, you'll be able yeah. to talk about a few more things with Siri every year or, or, you know, Alexa or whatever, that stuff's going to continue to grow. It's still in five years, not going to be that smart. It's still not going to be Samantha. So, you know, come back to her, the, the movie that you mentioned, Samantha really understood like all of what's going on. So, yeah. you know, in one of the opening scenes, she um, says like, you know, what's bothering you is like my email. Um, and, and he's in, she comes back like two seconds later and says, well, I noticed you have 17, thousand messages i deleted two thousand of them for you these were duplicates or whatever and like yeah yeah um you know we we're not gonna have machine reading at that level there's one thing from samantha that we won't have in five years where you can actually trust it to fully organize your email is if you have an important message any system right now could easily mess it up so you know i got a message from you to to do this podcast that's an important message but maybe you know i actually and it's a weird week but i got like 20 um, messages like that. I'm not always so popular, but like, yeah, you know, it, it could have gone to spam. And, and I mean, we have problems with spam filters and like AI is not going to solve that problem immediately. Um, Cause it still doesn't have enough sophistication. Like there's, there's a, I, I think it's X.AI has been promising for years, just doing your scheduling. And for a while, I think they had humans behind the scenes. If I remember correctly, I could have yeah. the wrong. Well, I mean, there. it's incredibly hard. But, I mean, I, I have a extremely accomplished assistant that does my scheduling who's extremely smart and like she's a lot smaller than any ai I and mean, even there it's like so hard to 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 do it it's like that's a it's very very hard stakes. task for an ai to do yeah it's high stakes if you miss a meeting like that really matters and yep like that's not a solved problem so imagine just how hard it is to do scheduling with a machine where you have your calendar in front of you and whatever but still things come up in, in the software. Also, you have uh, <laughs> you have your own nuances. Like, I like to do this in the morning or I need some space in between. Uh, give me some That's space right. to go to the bathroom or whatever it is. Right. You know? And, you know, I, I think in five years, humans are still going to be better. Uh, the machines are that even though there's a lot of effort. And that's just like a narrow part of reading your email. So like what Samantha yeah. is doing, it's like way beyond just looking at your calendars, presumably. Um, so another part of Samantha that I think is way beyond us right now is Samantha actually understands human interaction. And I mean, she understands it so well that the character falls in love with her. Yeah. Um, we actually do have software that people are dumb enough to fall in love with now. Um, or, or I'm trying to find a more polite word, to have the will to believe to fall <laughs> in love with now. But there, there's a level of like social understanding that Samantha has towards the end. The, I mean, the critical plot twist depends on her not having one piece of social understanding. Um, she doesn't really get monogamy um, yeah. without quite giving away the whole film. Um, but she gets a lot about human interaction and what would make people feel better and, and this kind of stuff. And I don't think we that we're five years away from that. I think we're much more than five. I don't think it's yep. impossible, but it's harder. So like the paradigms that we have now are like, I show you a picture of a pencil and I say pencil and the machine learns the name of some concrete physical object that, that we can put in a bitmap. And yes. something like love or harm or pain or need or you know any of these kind of psychological terms, your justice, more abstract political terms, it's just much harder to push those into the paradigm that we know how to use now and suggest to me we actually need different paradigms for some aspects of AI. Yeah. And so the, uh, going back to the Scott Alexander Slate Star Codex thing. The other debate that we were having, uh, aside from like how much progress are we making now and so forth, was really like, do we need to change what we're doing or not? And ultimately, he offered me not quite a bet, but a prediction. He said, you know, that he thought there was a 60%, no, a 40% chance that we could get to real you know, general artificial intelligence just by using the tools we have now, more data and so forth. Okay. And I, I wrote a lengthy reply um, called Paradigm Shift or something like that, um, where I said, you know, I thought it was more like an 80% chance, which may not sound so different, 40 versus 80. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I walked through why I think the differences are and why I think it's actually really important that, that we as a research community consider paradigm shifts um, and why, why I think we probably won't get there just by adding more data and we do need something substantial. But the data is important. There is a sense that like, as we can join these data sets together, we could potentially uh, solve bigger, bigger problems. It's like, we have access to a very, very small amount of data. Um, I think data is critical. I think it's really interesting that human children become more sophisticated understanders of the world 
than any computer is now, even with a lot less data. Um, <clears throat> I think ultimately, you know, you want to take advantage of whatever data you've got, but if it's a small amount of data, you still want to be able to do something with it. I think you know that I um, built a machine learning company that I sold to Uber. Yep. And when I sold it, I had a conversation with Travis, who was still CEO at, at that point. And I was explaining what my company did, which is we work with small amounts of data. And he, he said, oh, I get it, the data frontier problem. And he gave an example, which was like, he knew how to put the right amount of cars in the right place at let's say 11 o'clock on a Thursday night because he had plenty of data around that. But there just weren't enough cars at let's say three in the morning for his techniques that he already had to give a reliable answer. So even yep. you know Travis who had more data than anybody ever had on anything at that point still ran into like, if you break things down into smaller subcategories. So you know the tenderloin at 3 a.m. on a Thursday um, you know, there's not enough data there, even when you're accumulating massive amounts of data. So, yeah. you know, if you're Google, you have enough data for most things, but even Google actually has this problem. Um, there are always these cases. And then, you know, like jet on a runway, maybe Tesla just had zero cases in that. So you need to solve that in a different way by having a general understanding of what an airplane is, what a large physical object is, rather than doing it by memorizing this specific case and looking for a lot of similar cases. So you don't want to throw away the data that you do have. It's often extremely useful, um, but you also need some paradigms that are a little bit de less data driven than I think the ones we have now. Yeah. All right, cool. This has been amazing. All right, last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice do you think is generally bad advice? Um, conventional advice that's generally bad advice. Um, it's funny that I'm stumped on this one right now because um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of it. Um, how, how about trust your instincts um, is a piece of conventional wisdom. And it's sometimes true. There was a kind of Malcolm Gladwell part of the story for a while about like experts don't like know blink. anything or they yeah. do it in a blink. And it's not really true. And in fact, one of the most important things that scientists know is that for almost any piece of data, um, sorry, yeah, for any piece of data, you will have your own theory and it will seem to fit your own theory. But if you think about it carefully from someone else's perspective, you'll realize it could be explained in a different way. And so if you trust your instincts too much, you become too in love with your own ideas. There's an old saying about, you know, falling in love with your own press clippings. And it's, it's a version of that. Yep. Um, the psychological phenomena, there are two. Uh, well-known ones. One's called confirmation bias. So you have a theory, you notice other data for it. And the other one's called motivated reasoning. So you come up with reasons so you can keep believing what you're believing. So you don't have to believe that you've made a mistake. Yeah, guys. So I'm, I'm for gun hit. control or something. I see so you're for gun control, then everything and, looks like an argument. It's like I could, I could, I could justify anything or or put a reason. Or you're against anything. it. Yeah, right? or against you it know, or whatever. If else. you're yeah. against gun control and you see you've all, then you say we should buy more guns. Like I heard people yeah. say that on NPR. And so, you know, I mean, I'm for gun control, you can probably guess, and I probably can't even pretend that I'm neutral on it. But um, the point is, whichever side you're on, on any, you know, hot button issue like that. Or even smaller things. I'll give you a much smaller one, which is like, who did the more dishes? If you live in a house yeah. with, let's say, two adults that may be married or whatever they are, I guarantee you that both people will think that they did more than whatever their fair share is. And if you add up, you say, give it to me in percentage score. Yeah. And, you know, like the person- oh, add up to like 130, 140 or something. Yeah. yeah. And if you do it in a group house- yeah, you know, like I lived in graduate school, like five of us is going to add up to like 270. Right. And like the dishes aren't really getting done. So or imagine if like right. your, uh, your, 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 your baseball team or something like that. I imagine uh, nobody thinks like the ref is super fair to them, right? They always That's think right. the it's ref like, is yeah. always fair to the yeah. other side, yeah. whichever side you're on. Exactly. So there's all these kind of biases and stuff like that. Um, is if you trust your own instincts, you're like, I know what that call was. I mean, he was out. I mean, who are we kidding? That guy was right. And I'm like, I wasn't out. Who are you kidding? Oh, right. And, and so, so I think we, there's, there's value in knowing and calibrating your own instincts, but there's also value in thinking about alternative hypotheses and, you know, maybe the other person's right. And that could be on a scientific matter. It can be on the dishes. It can be on your, you know, on the calls in your sports game. Um, we got all this polarization in the world because we're naturally inclined to believe that we are correct and to not take the other guys, um, view seriously. 
Um, and so that'll be the conventional wisdom I will challenge for. Today. All right. This is amazing. I, I follow you at Gary Marcus on Twitter. Is that the best place for our audience to engage with you? I would say that. And now I have this thing, GaryMarcus.substack.com. GaryMarcus.substack.com. Yeah. Which I also like. So yeah. All right. This is amazing. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Really Thanks appreciate uh, you joining Always us. Always a pleasure. Us.